Good morning, welcome to worship. My name is Lauren. And I'm Brooklyn. We would love for you to check in with us so that we know you're worshiping with us here today. If you have downloaded the Sunrise app, simply go to Worship Check-In and fill out the form right from your phone. If you are worshiping in building, you can also fill out one of the white cards located on one of the crates and drop it into the offering boxes towards the back whenever you leave today. If this is your first time worshiping with us online or in building, this is also an opportunity for us to learn more about you. We make a one-time donation on your behalf to one of our local missions, the Grace Period, which helps hurting people in our community transition into stable, permanent housing. Besides our app, make sure you also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our newsletter so that you can stay up to date with what's going on in our church. Here are a few upcoming discipleship opportunities that we would like to share with you today. Sunrise has become a big part of the sharing shed in O'Fallon during our Serve Saturday quarterly events. And now, Sunrise has the opportunity to participate at the sharing shed the first Saturday of every month. If you would like to serve alongside your Sunrise friends and family, sign up today. We could really use more men too. You will love serving here and it's just for a few hours on Saturday morning of the month of your choice. To see the dates available, visit the link you see on the screen. Load up the car and come to the Outdoor Movie Night Fundraiser, benefiting the grace period. You can reserve your tickets by visiting the events page of our website. So bring the whole family and have a fun night out. Concessions will be available for an additional cost too. The Sunrise College Scholarship in honor of Troy Bierenbaum has been established to fulfill the church's mission to populate the kingdom of heaven by helping each recipient become an educated, responsible Christian citizen. The financial assistance can be used for the next upcoming academic year. Sunrise Church believes each scholarship recipient should possess the qualities that Troy Bierenbaum has demonstrated, which is faith, determination, and perseverance. The deadline to apply is at the end of this month. You can easily apply on the link you see on the screen. We are so glad that you're here with us today. Now, let's get ready to worship. Good morning, welcome to worship. My name is Lauren. And I'm Brooklyn. We would love for you to check in with us so that we know you are worshiping with us here today. <laughs> so that we know we are worshiping, worshiping with us here today. today. Welcome to Sunrise. <laughs> We're so happy you're here. <laughs> welcome to Sunrise. <laughs> Can you imagine if they just made a blooper reel? <laughs> Welcome to Sunrise! It would all be me. It was just every time. It's great to be here with you guys today. Will you please stand and join us? Let me pray this morning. God, we just, we love you. We're just so happy that you're here, and we are just so ready to worship you, Lord. You're the reason I live. You're the reason why we're here, Lord. We just... Just want you to fill us with abundance of joy and happiness and let us pour that into you, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Rain from heaven, fill me plenty. All I need to satisfy. Oh, 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 oh. with your love, my heart so flowing.
faithful promises And time and time again You have proven You do just what you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast Let my heart learn And when you speak a word I'll come This morning, as we have opportunity to be able to go to the Lord in prayer today, God, great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness in all things, in all parts, in every moment of our lives. Lord, so often when I come to you in prayer, I, I bring with you my list of things that I demand that you do my way and in my time frame. And then I step back and 
often become frustrated, defeated, that it doesn't happen exactly the way that I want. But Lord, I'm reminded this morning in the words of that song, great is your faithfulness to me. For everything is always answered in your perfect way, in your perfect will, in your perfect word. And Lord, I confess that there are times in my life, maybe all of us, that we reject your word, your way, and your will, and we try to do things on our own. So Lord, hear us this morning as we lift up a confession of that sin. Hear us this morning as we desire to, to receive the joy that we can find in our lives by being connected to you. Lord, uh, we lift up the blessings that you pour upon us and how you make us a blessing to other people. So in the midst of our prayer this morning, yes, we have requests, we have situations, we have challenges, we have trials, we have struggles. But great is your faithfulness to us. Lord, as we come together this day, as we set aside what might be minor differences in the kingdom of heaven, that is, draw us together in one spirit and one heart. As we join together our hearts and our voices, as we take the hands of those around us, as we lift up in power and in confidence the words that you taught to your family. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed would be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, friends, I want to welcome you to worship this morning. We're also welcoming those who are worshiping with us online today. And I just want to share with you at this time where we celebrate uh, our generosity and opportunity for you uh, to be part of one of the great ministries we have here at Sunrise, our Food for Hope and More program. Uh, over the last two years, we have uh, reached out into our community and provided uh, thousands and thousands of bags of groceries to folks uh, within the school systems here and in Wright City as well as just families in need. Uh, and you might think, well, if school is out, then the need is reduced just the opposite, actually. Uh, as children are home for the summer uh, and uh, there's not the opportunity for maybe one or two meals uh, provided by the school, uh, our need to be able to provide three meals a day uh, grows exponentially. So I would encourage you uh, to, be, to go to our website, go to our area that says mission, uh, click on the Food for Hope banner that you see there, and you'll discover what our latest needs are uh, and how you can get them to us uh, so that we can continue to distribute uh, those items out to families in need. Secondly, uh, if you'd like to do a little bit more in that ministry area, uh, you can also sign up to be part of a rotational team uh, that helps deliver groceries to, to families in need that are outside the school system. Uh, and we do that on a regular basis several times a week. Uh, if you would like to do that and like, love to be able to deliver those groceries, here's what you can do. Uh, you can send an e email to info at sunrisefamily.org. Whether you're in building online, you're able to do that if you love driving and love helping people. Uh, it is a first come, first serve basis. So when the call goes out, whoever responds to the text first gets the opportunity to serve. So if you would like to be part of that, I would love for you to join us. Now, other ways to help in generosity to support all the many ministries and missions here at Sunrise, both those that reach out into the community as well as those uh, that help grow people in discipleship here. Uh, you can do that through your generosity, either by in-building folks, uh, you can drop that in the offering boxes as you exit the doors, or anyone online and in-building can go to our website, go to our app, uh, and follow the instructions on those to be able to gener generously give to the mission and ministry of Sunrise. So I just want to celebrate that today. Uh, and as we get ready to, to move into the next part of our worship service, I'd like to take a moment 
for you to look around. If you see someone in building today you do not know, make a mental note that you will introduce yourself to that person when the worship service is over. So go ahead and do that. Now. Anytime. And then when you are done with that, you can look over to the, my left, over to the camera there, wave to the folks online. It's very important that you do that because that will play a part of the rest of the service is that you know there's people out there and they know that you're here today. Whoa, friends, I am excited. We are in week number three of our new Sunrise series called Who We Are. I love uh, that, that Bob Ross type character that's part of that because it reminds me of what he is doing in that picture is sketching out uh, a new sunrise. And what we are doing in this series is revealing and growing together in what may be the new sunrise going into the future. Uh, this uh, series is based upon the work of the sunrise staff who over the last six months have come together and have challenged each other and been in conversation uh, to help identify what their roles and their tasks are as your Sunrise staff. And, and so we're sharing that with you through a five-week series. This is week number three. Uh, and each of those gives us an opportunity to not only know what our staff is focused on, what our leadership is focused on, but an opportunity for you as part of the Sunrise family. And if you are here today, if you're worshiping with us online, you are part of the Sunrise family automatically. Uh, this gives you an opportunity to say, this is where I can jump in. This is where I feel called. This is where, where I think God is leading me to be part of, of that sketching out of what, who we are here at Sunrise. Uh, so this week, uh, I want to share with you about how we share who we are. Now, a couple weeks ago, Christy sh began this series talking about inviting people to church and how that kind of causes people to be a little bit nervous, that, that whole idea of talking about church outside of church uh, kind of just makes it awkward and uncomfortable at times. Well, if that does, then when I start talking about sharing about who we are, I mean, that just like raises it like exponentially. I mean, because folks have this weird idea of what it means to share about who we are, about who Jesus is. They, they first of all feel like they have to know like every verse of scripture in the Bible. You don't have to do that. Folks get all nervous thinking, wow, I need to be able to, to answer every deep theological question someone may have. You don't have to do that. Some people get all nervous about sharing their faith, thinking, wow, I don't know the Roman road to salvation, so how can I lead somebody to Christ? You don't need to know that. In fact, some people uh, kind of get all nervous about, well, the biggest thing is that they're fearful of being rejected if they share the gospel. Friends, let me tell you, in 35 years of ministry, I have been turned down more than a hotel bedspread. <laughs> so you got to get over that. Rejection is part of it because the, because the reality is, the reality is you may, you may share to a hundred different people and get 99 rejections. And if one person says yes through your witnessing of your faith, through your sharing, that person could make the entire difference in the world. I bet if I asked how many people in here know the name Albert McMicken, there'd be one because they were in the last service. <laughs> you may have never heard of Albert McMicken, but I bet you have heard of Billy Graham. How many people have heard of Billy Graham? If you're online, just put an amen over in the column there. It says comment section. See, Albert McMicken was the man that led Billy Graham to salvation. So it was Albert McMicken that has that opportunity to witness to one person. And Billy Graham said yes, and you know what that meant to the world? Everybody, everybody in Christianity is familiar with the name Billy Graham. So you may, you may be somebody's Albert McMicken so that we produce the next Billy Graham. So that's exciting. So don't worry about getting turned down 99 times if one time, one time you can help somebody discover Jesus. Now the other thing that folks think about when they think about sharing is, oh, I've got to talk to people. You don't. In fact, we're going to be looking at a passage of scripture today that says that talking is the smallest part of sharing Jesus. Uh, we're going to be today uh, in, in the uh, New Testament book, in the letter 1 Peter. Now, if you want to turn there, I want to bring you up to speed because I love, I think it's important 
bringing people up to speed about the books that we're reading. In fact, one of our uh, discipleship goals for 2023, yes, we are already visualizing 2023, uh, is to be able to offer to the congregation uh, an opportunity to take a journey through the Bible with the, with the intent of just doing an overview of every book in the Bible uh, so that when I say we're in 1 Peter, you'll be able to say, oh, I know what 1 Peter is about. I understand the makeup of it. I know who the audience is, or at least have notes that you can refer to pretty quickly uh, and be able to say, yes. Now, we're not going to do that in, in 52 weeks. The journey of, a, of the lifetime that we're going to do is going to be broken up from January of 2023 through the summer of 2024 with five, six, or seven week segments with major breaks in between. Now, you're going to hear a lot about this over the next seven months because this is like the most exciting thing that I think is on my plate right now is leading this. And so maybe, we, maybe you say, well, I'm interested in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. So you'll sign up for the January and February class. Then you can take a break and say, you know, I'm not as interested in what's next, so I'm going to wait. Maybe the book of Revelation is like where you want to hang out for seven weeks. That's going to be in the Lent series in 2024. Maybe the Minor Prophets. I've always wondered about the Minor Prophets. That's going to be in August of 2023, four weeks of that. So you get the idea. You can sign up and take what you want, and then we'll probably turn around in the fall of 2024 and start all over again. Because my greatest desire is for folks to have a command of what God's word is for us. It's vital. It's who we are. It's the songs we sing. Uh, we're doing you know, the Daily Walk Bible right now, and we're in the book of Psalms, and it's amazing. I think we're in Psalm, we read Psalm 30, up to Psalm 30 today, and how many times we'll stop and go, wait a minute, that's a praise song. Those are the words from the praise. Like, that's where it comes from. And that's just kind of a neat thing to be able to say. So here we are. We're in the book of 1 Peter. Here's the, here's the lowdown on it. It was written by the apostle Peter, Simon Peter, uh, one of the inner circle of, of Jesus's three inner circle. It was written around 64 AD or shortly uh, after the apostle Paul had written many of his letters. Peter was in Rome. And just like Paul, he was waiting to be taken before Caesar uh, and facing his execution because he was unwilling to be quiet, to stop sharing about Jesus. And, and so he's writing this at the height of the persecution of the Christians by Emperor Nero. Now, if you're not familiar with how, how just horrible it was for Christians under Nero, uh, it was said that Nero would take those who were Christians, who would not renounce their faith, uh, and he would crucify them, and he would line the roads coming into the city of Rome in all four directions with crucified Christians and with plenty of wording so that folks were warned that if you do not renounce Jesus, you're going to end up here. For those that were more prominent and adamant about staying faithful to Jesus, he would also take Christians and he would, he would crucify them around the perimeter of the palace in Rome, out at the edge of the gardens. And then when he would have his wild and debauchery parties, he would pour oil on those Christians as they were crucified and light them as torches to light up the parties at night. Peter is writing to Christians who were experiencing this. Christians who were being persecuted not only in the city of Rome, but throughout the entire Roman Empire. This is a word of encouragement, and I imagine, because Peter knew that his death was inevitable, that it was soon, that he probably was a little bit more adamant. Although I can't imagine Peter being any more adamant than he is at any other time. But, but when you know that your time is near and that you have just a short time to get a message across, he doesn't mind holding back. He pulls no punches. He lets the folks know what they need to know to be solid and strong in their faith. So that kind of sets up where we're at today. And we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture uh, that actually can be divided into two sections. Uh, the first part of that scripture is what uh, is identified as, as how we have relationship with people inside the church. So I want you, if you're in building, to look around. I want you to take a moment and look all the way around, all 360 degrees, 
Uh, you know, if your head doesn't turn that way, your body might have to. Uh, and I want you to see who's here. Uh, I want you to see who. Folks online, you remember those people that waved at you on camera just a little while ago? Those are the folks in building. And if we could see on the other side of that lens, we could see you at home today. This is people who believe in Jesus. This is the church. These first few verses are Peter writing to people who have accepted Jesus as their Savior. And he's giving us the standard by which we are to live. Now, remember, we're talking sharing about Jesus. But the sharing about Jesus that Peter is talking about doesn't come from words. It comes from actions. <laughs> and most importantly, it comes from reactions to life. So let's begin reading. We're in verse number eight. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Now, there are five things in that one verse that should, ought to be our checklist every day when we roll out of bed with a smile on our face, ready to, to meet the day ahead of us. Uh, those are the things that, that identify in our relationship with people who are Christians, how we should deal with Christians. We should have, have a one mind or be in harmony uh, we should be able to sympathize with each other, understand that everybody has a, can have a rough spot in life and that we need to be open and reflective of what's going on in their lives. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Maybe we ought to love each other better than we love our brothers and sisters at times, because uh, I've heard some good stories. We're to be compassionate. And the tough one is that we are to have a humble attitude. Now, let me identify humble in this manner, not as being something where we roll over and play dead and let people walk all over us. Uh, it means that, that we should be willing to receive help with some of our areas of weakness. In other words, we need to be humble in such a way that we identify what our weaknesses are, self-identify. Now, sometimes you folks want to tell me what my weaknesses are, and I welcome that. But remember the part that says, do it with sympathy and one mind. Uh, be gentle, be kind. Uh, but we need to recognize that we can't do everything. There are areas that other people are better qualified, better gifted, and better capable than what we are, and the ability to step back and have humility so that people can work together for the kingdom of God. Verse number eight, or number nine. Ooh, if we, all the other ones were what we should do, here's some things we shouldn't. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. I mean, that just kind of takes all the fun out of life, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, some of us, we think that's our spiritual gift, is, is retaliating and repaying. But Peter goes on to say, instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessings. Remember Abram in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis? God calls him to leave his homeland and go to a place he's never been before to do something he has no idea what he's supposed to do. He just followed God, and God's words is, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to others. We are to be a blessing to other people. Look around this room again, friends. Look around, because I am sure there's probably somebody in this room you need to bless and not think about retaliation or repaying evil. And we're talking about Christians. We haven't got outside the building yet, friends. We're still in the building. What we need to do is be an example of God's grace to all people. It means that we need to pray for those who come after us verbally. We need to be lifting them in prayer. I know that so often in our prayer time, we lift up the people we love, the people we know, the people that are, are hurting, the people that, that need some support in times of grief. How often in your prayer life do you pray for those who have verbally come after you and have insulted you and not praying that they get hit by a bus? Yeah. I know some of you. Praying, praying. <laughs> I'm not going to say any names. Don't worry. <laughs> Praying that God would bless them. 
It means that our grace is that we treat adversaries kindly, and even we treat them with an understanding of sympathy. When we have sympathy for even our adversaries, we are sometimes enlightened to what the burr is under their saddle. And that gives us something to pray for. We're to forgive them even when they have hurt us deeply. Remember the words of Jesus? One of the final sets of words he gave from the cross when he was being inflicted the worst form of execution that humanity has ever conceived in their minds and was dying one of the most painful deaths imaginable. He looks down from the cross, fully human, and says, Father, forgive them for what they have done. Friends, if Jesus can forgive that, if Jesus can forgive what I've done, what you've done, then couldn't we be the example of Christ and forgive even those who have hurt us deeply? In verse 10, Peter calls in uh, the quoting of a psalm, uh, Psalm 34. So if you're reading the Daily Walk Bible, guess what? Tomorrow, that's part of your reading. So you can check this out to make sure that we're doing it correctly. Uh, and he says, for the scripture says... If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days. I want to stop right there. How many folks in here would say, my goal is to enjoy life and have many happy days? If you didn't raise your hand, I have some openings this week. <laughs> Might need a session or two, don't we? I think, and if you're online, just put in amen over there when you say, I want a good, uh, happy life and to enjoy my life and have many happy days. If you want to do that, let me tell you how. I can save you a whole lot of money simply by saying, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Well, that's no big deal, is it? Well, you need to read the book of James about the tongue. It's not that easy. So, so it means that we have to work at it. It means if we want to have an enjoyable life and have happy days, not the TV show, but, but our own, we want to be able, if you're not old enough to know that, look at somebody with gray hair. <laughs> or no hair, and they'll fill you in. <laughs> we need, see, I've already violated that. That was kind of evil, wasn't it? So I wanted to give you an example. Uh, do not speak evil, and don't let lies, even little white lies, Little white lies are as offensive to God as whatever you think of the worst thing you could do in the world is a sin against God. If we want that happy and enjoyable life, silence the tongue and do not let lip lies come from our lips. Verse 11, David goes on to say, turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work, work to maintain it. Hear that word? That's a, that's a verb, work. It doesn't come easy. Let me tell you, when you become a follower of Jesus, it is not rainbows, lollipops, and gumdrops. It is work. Verse 12, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Not only do we have the prescription of how to have an enjoyable and happy life, we also see what the antithesis is when we don't, God frowns upon those actions. When lies and evil come from us, we, God just says, whoa, that's not what we expect. Now remember, we're still talking about inside the church. Look around again, friends. Look around at all these Christians here, and Peter is talking about those actions within a church. I don't think he's talking about this church. It's probably your neighbor's church. <laughs> But it should never happen inside the life of the church because we have a focus. We talked last week, our mission is to populate the kingdom of heaven. And when we work together, no matter who we are, no matter what our background is, no matter what our, what our own personal agendas may be, we set those aside so that we can fulfill the mission working together because we are better together. God has brought a diversity of people into this church, into this family, and it makes us better when we have a diversity of thought, but we have unity of mind. Does that make sense? It's the gospel being shared. And we're sharing it so far, so far through these verses by what? Action and reaction. Verse 13, now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? Okay, time out. I've read that verse and this is like one of those head scratchers. 
Here he is writing to people who are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. And I searched commentaries. I, I was on the internet. I looked all I could. And I didn't ever find, like, what's, what's Peter saying here? Well, I realized what he's saying. This is a rhetorical question with a tongue-in-cheek statement. Of course, if you are a follower of Christ, it is unavoidable uh, not to be persecuted, not to be given an opportunity uh, to, to be put on edge for your faith in Jesus. So he says, of course it's going to happen. Just understand that. Don't think that you're going to escape it unless you are like quiet about it and you don't share. But if you're willing to share, to let your life be an example of Christ, then yeah, it's going to happen. So in verse 14, uh, Peter makes a shift now. He goes from relationships within the church family to relationships with people outside the church family. So I want you to think for a moment, whether you're in building or online, think for a moment uh, of the potential people you may come in contact with the rest of this day, no matter where, you're, where you may be going, or this week at work or at school or, or wherever you may be, your social gatherings, your outings, maybe just standing in line at the grocery store or driving down you know, the interstate where all good things happen when you're driving with other people, because uh, that's where most people display their best Christianity <laughs> or lack thereof. Think about all those places. And this is the relationship that we're supposed to have with folks outside the church. Verse 14. But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry about or be afraid of the threats. Remember, these are Christians in first century, 63, 64, 65 AD, that are under the persecution of the Roman Empire for saying that I'm a follower of Jesus. And so they are receiving threats. They are being persecuted. And what Paul is saying, this is a classic example of the squaring off of opposing powers. The powers of good versus evil. And let me tell you, friends, I've read the book cover to cover more than once. And every time in the book when good versus evil happens, God always prevails. God always wins. The last chapter in the last book of the Bible, God is victorious. We sing that song, Victory in Jesus. We, we sing songs, we read scripture that promotes that all things are possible through God. I love Romans, what Paul says there. He says, if God is for us, do you know it? Who can be against us? There is nothing in all creation that can prevail against followers of Jesus. We are more than conquerors. We are more than victorious. Nothing separates us. So in the battle of good or evil, whatever you're going through right now, if you feel that evil is crushing down on you, take heart. God will prevail. It may not be in your timing. It may not be in the way you think. But I will tell you, the book tells me over and over and over again, and the book doesn't lie, that God will prevail. Good will always win over evil. Verse 15, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Here we are, verse 15, with seven verses, friends, seven verses and how we are to share Christ, and Peter finally gets around to it. We've had a whole lot of action and reaction. Sharing requires that be able for us to be able to speak. We have to be able to create a sense of connection with someone. I mean, think about it. How many times does somebody come up, knock on your door, ring your doorbell, and, they, and you open it up and they're saying, I want to share with you about Jesus. I, I will confess my response is, I shut the door. Because you know what? I have no relationship, no connection, no credibility standing on the other side of that door. So what Peter is saying, that before you ever open your mouth about Jesus, you have to establish credibility through your actions and your reactions. And I love that Peter is writing this. Remember Peter? Remember Peter what happened on the night Jesus was arrested when he went to the courtyard following at a distance and three times people said, hey, tell me about your Jesus. He goes, I don't know him. I'm not with him. 
There's no connection here. Peter is saying there will come a time when we will need to open our mouth. And when we open our mouth, we need to be able to say this is our hope as a believer. Do you know what your hope as a believer is? Do you have a two-minute statement of where your hope rests? Verse 16, but do this in gentle and respectful ways. See that? Gentle and respectful. Not a bull in a china closet. Do it gently and respectfully. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed and what they see, uh, what good life you live because you belong to Christ. See, actions, actions introduce our opportunity to do, use words. Now, do you hear that? You got to establish the actions and the reactions before you ever open your mouth. And then our words validate our actions. And if there ever is a disconnect, if people hear us say one thing, but we act another way, then we have become a bad representative of the kingdom of heaven. Our words and our actions need to coincide. So let me ask you, what do others see and hear in your life? Would they be shocked to know that you're a follower of Jesus because they've watched you live? Or have they seen how you reacted to some of the struggles and challenges and tough times in your life and go, wow, I want to know that. I want to be like that. See, that's, that's the essence of sharing who we are here at Sunrise. We are action and reaction people. And then if we need to, be able to say words. In 1886, actually 1896, I don't know if anybody was alive back then, a guy named Charles Sheldon wrote what is now known as the most prolifically read Christian novel in existence. Over 50 million copies in 126 years have been purchased, and probably those copies have been read multiple times by multiple people. Does anybody know what he wrote in 1896? Well, good, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> it's a little book called In His Steps. Now, that may not be familiar, but in the 1990s, this this wild, crazy youth pastor in Wisconsin got an idea that he, he read this book and said, wow, I think we could really turn this into a movement that is known today as the WWJD, not the WWF. I saw you looking at like, what? No. <laughs> WWJD, what would Jesus do? It's a story about a pastor in, in rural Kansas that the Holy Spirit came upon him, God anointed him, and he stood in front of his normal congregation on a normal Sunday, kind of a complacent group of people that can often be said of most every church, and he challenged them. He said, for the next year, every decision that you make in your life, every decision, small and humongous, every action and reaction before you allow it to happen, ask yourself, what would Jesus do in this situation? Now, I don't want to give the book away because I know you're all going to rush out and buy it now and read it. It transformed this rural church. It transformed this community. And it launched, through the book, a movement a hundred years later. Maybe you, any of you ever wear the WWJD bracelets or have the bumper stickers or any of the t-shirts? And what a great idea, but like all things, it ebbs and flows and disappears and we fall back into complacency. So maybe I want to challenge you, friends, for the rest of 2022. Every decision you make, every action, every reaction before any word comes out of your mouth, Ask yourself, what would Jesus do? You may not be aware of this, but besides uh, a psalm that this is based on, uh, Charles Sheldon used 1 Peter as the text for this movement. It's relevant today. It's how we share who Jesus is. It's how we share who we are here at Sunrise by asking, what would Jesus do? Now, all that because I'm leading up to what our, our memory verse is. Yeah, we've not dropped that. I think it's really great. 
uh, to continue with memory verses. And now the memory verse I'm going to show you is from 1 Peter, the second chapter, really kind of one of the, one of the verses that spurred Sheldon on. And I've given it to you in two different ways. Uh, the Bible says in it, it is God's will. Remember, that's one of the things we pray for is that we follow God's will, God's way, and God's word. Well, here's how you follow God's will, that your lives should silence those who make foolish accusations against you. In other words, that the, the credibility of your life as a follower of Jesus will silence anybody that wants to talk evil of you. But I felt like that verse needed some personalization. If it's going to be a memory verse, if it's going to infect us and impact us, uh, then what I want to do is make it like your verse. So, so the bottom part of that is what I want us to read today as our memory verse together. It is God's will that my life should silence those who make foolish accusations against me. And you do that by asking, what would Jesus do? Because that's who we are here at Sunrise. Let us pray. God, as we come here today, I give you thanks for the power of your word. Lord, I give you thanks for a book that's 126 years old that still is relevant in our world today, in our individual lives. And I pray that each one of us today would embrace that our lives are such a way that there is no credible accusation against how we live, but our lives and our words are concise and coordinated and in sync with what Jesus would do in every situation we may face. Lord, as we come together today, I just give you thanks for this opportunity to celebrate, not only in this room, but across the entire United States of folks worshiping with us today, this morning, this week. Lord, as we come together, we also have an opportunity to celebrate through Holy Communion. Lord, you took those disciples, those 12 men who one had betrayed you, another was going to deny you, and the rest of them would desert you, and you still, with grace, that grace that we talked about that Peter lifts up, that was extended to him by Jesus, Lord, we take that grace, and we receive what you offer to us, unconditional love and grace that is greater than our sin. Lord, we prepared the bread and the cup today, and I pray that you would pour upon us your blessings upon these gifts so they become for us your body, your blood, your presence in us and with us and through us. And Lord, as we have that opportunity, I just pray that you would fill us so that we would share who you are through our actions, our reactions, and our words. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we start communion today, I just I want to share with you, we had a new member class yesterday, and one of the questions that came up uh, was, was about communion. And, and I, I realized that I've been derelict uh, in my duty when it comes to this time, because usually it's like, oh, I'm running late on the clock, and uh, folks have been here for a while. Uh, what I fail to talk about when we do communion, yes, our communion table here at Sunrise is open to everyone in building, or if you're worshiping with us online, uh, it's available online as well. You can write to the uh, info at Sunrise and receive that. But it's open to everyone. But what I often fail to mention is that for those who are believers, the Bible is clear that there's a criteria that comes with it. For the non-believer, Wesley believed that that's where grace comes and you might discover that relationship with Christ, Christ through the celebration of Holy Communion. Come on, y'all. But on the other hand, those who are believers in Jesus, have given their lives to Jesus, who are, who are asking what would Jesus do, uh, Paul's pretty clear in Corinthians that before we receive communion, we need to make sure that we are focused on bettering our relationship with God. So maybe this morning, friends, before, before you unpeel and unseal, maybe you want to take a moment this morning to say, God, um, I want to be the best that I can. I, I want to be a fully committed follower. Uh, I, want to, I want to be someone that you would be proud of representing you when I leave this building. And, and when you've had that opportunity for discernment and prayer, then receive communion. Because in it, we find God's grace, we find God's love, and we discover peace in our lives. So friends, before you is the invitation. I just pray that you would receive what God offers today.
To share who we are, 
We speak Jesus with our hands and our feet, with our actions, our reactions, and oh yeah, every once in a while, with our voice. So I've got some discipleship questions I just want to share with you today. Uh, great for studies, great for home conversations, just great for anywhere. Uh, we're going to leave those up there, but a couple other things I want to share with you this morning, so, so give me a few seconds. Uh, first of all, you might be know I'm, I'm sporting a name tag because, you know, leaders are supposed to do the leadership stuff. Uh, we are doing new name tags here. If you would have ordered one through the new member class, uh, they are down the hallway. If you haven't, there's sheets down there to fill out so that you can get your own personalized. I mean, I really love the ones that the rest of the folks are rocking. They got all kinds of colors. Mine's just kind of boring. And it outs me as being part of the staff. So that means I'm supposed to know everything. Look for some other staff person. They know everything. Secondly, you may not be aware of this, but uh, our highly, highly gifted uh, music director, James Jones, is in the middle of a competition uh, called You, God's Music. Uh, and the second round of voting ends tonight at midnight. Uh, and James needs to be in the top 25 to be able to move into the next round. Now, uh, here's the deal. It costs a dollar a vote. Uh, so I know that's a little bit of expense for some folks, but hey, here's the great part. Uh, out of that dollar, 20 cents comes to Sunrise, 20 cents goes to James, and the rest is for the, the operation of the organization doing this. Now, we fully anticipate that at uh, one minute after midnight, James is going to be in the top 25. Yes. 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 So the next aspect of that, James needs to do a testimonial. And, and James wants that testimonial to include you folks who have supported him and have loved him uh, in the many years that he has been here. So immediately when we finish today, a couple things are happening. One, uh, you can hang around and visit. Uh, for those who would like to stay around to be part of the testimonial, we need a couple strong folks to tote up a sofa from the back room up here on stage. Uh, give us about 20 minutes to get everything set up with cameras uh, so that we can record that. Uh, and then uh, there's refreshments down the hallway if you want to kind of buy your time with that. And we'll be ready to go about 11 o'clock. Uh, and, and then after that, uh, James also has been blessed by a Hollywood movie producer falling in love with the first song that we sang and has asked that that be included as a theme for the movie that he is producing. Uh, and so he wants a live recording. So we captured it at the first, but we need a couple backs of people, a couple silhouettes of people uh, to add to that uh, flavor of that video. So if you want to stay around for a few minutes after the testimonial, hey, we'll do that. And you might be on a Hollywood movie. You could be like in the IMBD thing, uh, you know, <laughs> your back of your head maybe. But we would love for you to do that. I just think it's a great way to support James, bless James, and just how God has blessed us that we might be a blessing to other people. So all that, friends, let me, let me pray us out of here. Folks online, thank you for the extra few moments. Uh, if you can rush up here by 11 o'clock, you can be part of it as well. Now, my friends, may the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be poured out on us. Fill us till we are overflowing. And Lord, may we be a blessing to other people because you have blessed us in Jesus' name. Amen.